Tonight, we are excited to have very, some very special guests who are going to take us on a journey to Switzerland, to CERN, and into the largest and most powerful machine ever built, the Large Hadrian Collider. Dr. Amir Axel is a historian of science and math, as well as an acclaimed science writer. He just released his latest book, Present at the Creation, which describes his behind-the-scenes experiences at CERN. He will be joined by Dr. Stephen Rucroft, who is Emeritus Matthews Distinguished University Professor of Physics at Northeastern University. Dr. Rucroft has been the leader of several experiments at CERN himself, and it promises to be a very fascinating conversation and fun evening. But before Amir and Steve get started, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. Howard Messing is president and CEO of Medical Information Technology, Inc., more familiarly known as Meditech, and the chairman of the, board, of the museum's board of trustees. And he had the privilege of visiting CERN and is going to share that story with us. Please welcome Howard Messing. Thank you, Lisa. Um, as chairman here at the museum, I get the opportunity to come to a lot of these events, and um, sometimes I am asked by the staff, and I have to say yes. This is not an event that I had to say yes for. I, I immediately wanted to come. Um, normally, I would be spending my time in front of you doing a little marketing pitch for the museum and telling you about memberships and so forth and so on, but we're going to forget all that. Uh, one of the reasons that I am involved here at the museum is because I am a physicist wannabe. Um, can you hear me OK? Um, for my entire life, I've been an armchair physicist, whereas some people hang out, hang out outside the locker room at the Red Sox. If the MIT physics department had a locker room, I would be hanging out outside the locker room there. A couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to be uh, given a tour of CERN by none other than Jerry Friedman. Jerry Friedman, as some of you may know, is the MIT Nobel Prize winning physicist who discovered the quark in the late 1960s. And he and I became acquainted, and he offered to take my family and I to visit. This was about six months before it was turned on for the first time. So that's my family and I in front of the CMS de detector, which we will hear a little bit more about today. So that's why I'm here. And I hope that you will be as excited by this as I was. I'm hoping to rekindle a little bit of the excitement I felt when I was there a couple of years ago, and also when I read the new book last weekend. It was transported me back there, and I got some of the same excitement. It's much more than just a big physics experiment, and I, our guests will, I'm sure, talk a little bit about that. It's also very much an exercise in scientific cooperation and the meeting of the minds of people from throughout the world. One of the most striking images I have of when I was there was sitting in the cafeteria and watching an Israeli physicist talking animatedly with what was obviously an Arabic uh, physicist. Um, you would not know there's any problems between those different cultures by sitting there. They just cooperate. Um, and it's, it's truly remarkable. I'm not going to take up too much more of your time because we want to get to our guests and give them as much time as possible. So please enjoy the evening and uh, think up your questions because we're going to have questions at the end. And I'm sure that we will get some good answers and hear some interesting stuff. Thank you. Steve. Hello, Amir. How are you doing? Hi. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So this is a CMS detector. And uh, as you can see, the, the Messing family has, is, is dwarfed by this huge um, construction. This is the heaviest instrument ever built. It weighs more than the Eiffel Tower. And we'll see in a few minutes how it was lowered down 
uh, into the cavity. But before we go, we should show you the whole um, setup here. Now, while I was sitting uh, there waiting, um, I, I overheard some, one of you say, what about the people who lived there? Were they asked whether such a construction can be there? So I'll ask you that question. Yes, of course they were. <laughs> there was a lot of debate because a lot of the farmers and the local people were a little worried that maybe there's high levels of radiation. But of course, all this stuff is rather deep underground and, it, and it's, it's very, very safe indeed. So after a lot of debate, all the local people, all the local community leaders and the local farmers and the local, all the people, they all agreed that this was important for everybody. So they agreed to, to do it. Actually, the bigger uh, discussion came when th th this rather large, almost exactly a circle that you see there marked, well, it's not marked anything actually, but the one that has four uh, experiments around it, that, that's a tunnel that was built uh, underground at a depth of somewhere between 200 and six or 700 feet underneath the, the land, which is a, a, a bit of it is in Switzerland and most of it is under the land of France. And so it straddles the border between Switzerland and France. And that tunnel was built more than 20 years ago for a previous accelerator that was a CERN called LEP. And LEP stands for the Large Electron Positron Collider. For some reason, they lost the C. LEP is Large Electron. And that was, a, a, again, a, a two accelerators bolted together with electrons going one way and anti-electrons, the things we call positrons, going the other way. And we collided electrons and positrons at, at four locations that are not, not quite the same as the four there. And that was when there was a big debate because that was really breaking new ground. Uh, until then, CERN had always made sure that all of the equipment, all the accelerators and all the detectors and everything was on site so nobody could complain. And now for the first time, there's a significant chunk of stuff off the CERN site underground. So there was a lot of debate for LEP. But once LEP was approved and ran safely for more than a decade, and then CERN be the, being a rather parsimonious organization, it was decided that when we wanted the new accelerator, the LHC, we had to use the same tunnel because building a tunnel underground, and it's 17 miles around that tunnel. And the, the diameter of the tunnel is about 13 feet. So it's a, a, a long, thin, almost exactly circular object. And it was built using several tunneling devices called moles. And the engineers are the guys who I think are remarkable. I don't think you should be a physics groupie, but you should be an engineering groupie. <laughs> it's the engineers that do the work. They set off these moles digging underground, and they met to within a centimeter over a distance of 17 miles. Most remarkable engineering feat. But having done that and having built it and having operated LEP successfully for a decade or more, it was decided to remove LEP and put the new accelerator underground. And there wasn't really much debate about but that. Steve, you're a physicist, so I want to ask you about that. When you're colliding these particles in there, you are creating particles that actually come above ground because I know the muons go through a lot of stuff. They can go down to 100 meters underground and that's the depth, the average depth of the uh, tunnel. So if, you, if I'm over the detector and the amount of the numbers of particles that are colliding are, are, is very high in the, in the trillions or billions of particles, yeah. I think that you will get radiation from, from muons. Am well, right? yeah, but you know, we're getting radiation here now. And the level of radiation on the surface from the particles that come out of the collision is, is lower than the background, the so-called background radiation. When you sit in a room like this, there's concrete and stuff like that. And human beings too, we all radiate. We're all, everything in this universe is radioactive, everything. But we don't get black holes from space. No. What about? No, so there aren't any black holes. What about there? Do you what want to come to black holes yet? What about there? <laughs> well, we only can talk about black holes if you want, but only, that might be jumping the gun energy. a little bit. They're only at half energy. Hmm? They're only at half the energy. Well, the, the, so the, do you think a black hole can be created right there? No. No. It, 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 maybe if you want to talk about black holes, let, I, I, I really do need to say a couple of things. First of all, the, the concept of the, physics, <laughs> like all sciences, is a complex uh, kind of balance between experimental results 
and theoretical ideas. And it, it's necessary to have this balance, but it really is important that there is a balance there. And the concept of a black hole is really a theoretical concept. We, we've looked for evidence of black holes in the universe, and we found candidates in astrophysics, not in particle physics. We've never seen any evidence of black holes produced in particle physics. That's purely theoretical. But there is some evidence for black holes of masses bigger than the mass of our, of our sun, massive black holes. And there are some supermassive black hole candidates, but I emphasize the word candidate. At the center of our galaxy, there's an object which has a mass about three million times the mass of our sun, and we've no idea what the hell it is. We really don't know what it is. And we can't, we currently, no scientist can come up with any idea better than it, that it's a black hole. But we don't know it's a black hole. It's not been proven yet to be a black hole. And we really don't have a mechanism how such black holes could be formed, actually. Now, black holes on the order of the size of our sun, the mass of our sun, we do have a mechanism for that. It, it, when, it, when a big, massive star uses up all its nuclear fuel, it will collapse under the action of gravity. After going through a few tumultuous explosions, it will collapse. And if, if the mass is the mass of the remnant, if it's about the mass of our sun, it will form something called a neutron star. Now, that's theory. But we've actually looked for neutron stars, and we found clear, uh, unambiguous experimental evidence for the existence of neutron stars. Now, a neutron star, think about this for a minute. In a normal star like our sun, there are atoms. And atoms are made up of a nucleus with protons and neutrons, and then electrons buzzing around. Now, atoms are great because the number of electrons buzzing around are exactly equal to the number of protons in the nucleus. So if you can smush an atom together, all those electrons will fuse with the protons and make neutrons. And the atom just becomes a big blob of neutrons. Now, if you can do that to, to a whole star, you've just got a big blob of neutrons, and that's called a neutron star. And um, as amazing as that concept is, theoretical concept, we've actually got experimental evidence for such things. Now, here comes the tricky part. What happens if you've got a neutron star that's three times the mass of our sun, or 10 times, or 100 times the mass of the sun? And currently, theory says that such massive neutron stars will collapse under the action of gravity. And we've no idea at all what will happen to such a thing. Really, that's the truth. We've no idea. Now, the current theoretical belief is that such neutron stars, if their mass is above about three times the mass of the sun, they will collapse and collapse and collapse and keep on collapsing because there's no force in nature that we know of that can prevent that collapse. And when that happens, the object just shrinks and shrinks and becomes a point, a singularity. And when you get such a thing, that's usually referred to as a black hole. So and we've here. looked for such things, but we've okay. not found any. Good. So none here. That's good. So we're safe, at least for a while, <laughs> at least until the energy goes higher, maybe later, too. So uh, this oh, is Oh, you should let me finish, though. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you really <laughs> should let me finish. Uh, sure, sure. Because sure. those are the two easy black holes. I thought you didn't want to talk about no, black holes. No, you see, the point oh. is that some theorists who really ought to know better, who are really irresponsible, they say, well, you know, maybe since we don't understand gravity and we really don't know what the hell we're talking about in, in this domain, let's speculate that maybe at the LHC the gravitational force becomes anomalously strong and black holes get formed in the collision of the two protons. But that is completely off the wall. There's no experimental evidence to back that up in the remotest sense at all. And, and to think that black holes are formed at the LHC, I, I would say don't spend one microsecond thinking about it. It's, it's in line with another theory about black holes. If you look at our planet, Earth, and you measure the density of the, of the stuff that you can see, the stuff at the surface, and then you multiply that density by the volume of our planet, you get a mass half of the measured mass of our planet. In other words, the mass of our planet is two times bigger than you'd think it should be if you just take into account the density of the stuff that the Earth is made of. And so what the hell could that be? Well, most people say, well, probably the density of the Earth at the center is bigger than the density at the surface. But there's at least one theory, and you, if you don't believe me, Google it tonight. There's at least one theory. It's been published. Some guy says 
maybe there's a black hole at the center of the Earth, and that's where the missing mass of the Earth is coming from. That makes me that's feel theory. much better. That's theory. Good. So we live in a black hole. Who cares what's happening there? <laughs> so this is the tunnel. Uh, but I told you not to ask me about black holes, because oh, that's good. a big, it's a big subject. It's a big subject. <laughs> good. So uh, this, is, uh, this is it. That's the, uh, the accelerator. And that's one of the uh, um, detectors, one of the two main detectors called ATLAS. Uh, we'll see mo much more of it. Um, the two detectors basically detect the uh, particles that are created when the proton beams uh, collide. No black holes. They detect other things. Uh, they detect muons and uh, the jets of uh, quarks and uh, smaller, you know, lighter particles. And they look, they're looking for the Higgs and for a few other things. So um, this is basically what the uh, setup looks like. There are several accelerators here. And the reason there are so many of them is that CERN built accelerators over decades. And each one of them was the state of the art when it was built, um, except there are also accelerators, uh, well, in Germany, in the United States, and other countries that compete with these and have over the years. So what surprised me, actually, at CERN is that the protons come from a simple bottle of hydrogen, just a little hydrogen bo bottle. And the protons are obtained from this hydrogen gas. And then they go into a linear accelerator. We'll talk about the two kinds, which is a straight line. At the end of the line, the proton has a certain speed, and then it goes into the next one. So you can see there are, um, this is, here it starts, and then there's the SBS, and uh, this, the SBS is the last one that feeds into the LHC, the PS, PS booster, and the lineup, the linear accelerator. And then it goes into the LHC, and the LHC has uh, those eight points, uh, along some of which are detectors, and some remain from LEP, so they're empty, and nothing happens there. This is a better picture of just the LHC itself. And you can see the eight-point symmetry and the uh, may, may I make a comment yeah, on the please, previous please, slide? Yeah, please, anytime. Can you go back Previous one, one sure. I, I just, There's an error there, I know. It's not I just, 99. I just, yeah, I'd just like to make a little comment here. I, I said already that CERN is a pretty parsimonious place. And here's an example of that. The, the, what CERN does is, and, and this is the way particle physics has progressed for the last, I don't know, 50 or 60 years, that we keep on, we keep on building particle accelerators that are bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and what you would normally do is, if you, if you have a small one, and then you build a bigger one, you just throw the small one away, you know, disposable accelerators. But CERN doesn't do that. CERN uses the previous accelerator to accelerate particles and then inject those particles into the next accelerator. So you kind of save energy by doing that. And so at CERN now, we've got this sequence of accelerators. And for a guy like me, I mean, I, I did my PhD taking data at CERN back in the 60s with a beam of antiprotons, antimatter. And I use this little thing here called the PS. Can you see that little circle there? PS. PS just means proton synchrotron. And that was really the first major accelerator at CERN. It wasn't the first accelerator. They had smaller ones before that. But the PS was the first major one. And the PS was a big leap in the unknown because they used a technique that was unproven at the time. And everybody said, Accelerators won't work with this new technique, but CERN gambled, and it worked fantastically well. It was a, a brilliant success. And, and I worked at the PS for a long time. And then while I was working at CERN in the, um, in the 70s and 80s, we built the SPS. That, and SPS, you know, you'd think that these names would mean something clever. PS means proton synchrotron. Maybe that's clever. SPS means super proton synchrotron. <laughs> that's all it means. And, and, and the PS uh, you, injects it, into the SPS. When was it built, the SPS? Hmm? When was the SPS built? Well, it was built, it was finished in the early 80s. Oh, OK. And, and then the SPS, which was designed as a single proton accelerator. And in those days, we would accelerate the protons until they got the energy we wanted. And then we would eject them from the accelerator and smash them into a target of metal and do our experiments downstream of that. And then some very clever guys, and I know most of them, and I can assure you that one of them is the most clever human being I've ever met. Uh, he pushed the idea of using the SPS as a collider. Now, a single accelerator, you can't use it as a collider normally because you, you can't have protons going both ways. And this guy came up with a very clever idea of having protons going this way and antiprotons going the other way and then colliding them at two locations inside the SPS. 
And that became then known as the SPP bar S for S proton antiproton synchrotron. And, and the guy I mentioned as the cleverest guy I've ever met is a guy called Carlo Rubio. You may have heard of him. Some of you may have even met him. He was a Harvard professor for years, and then finally he left to become DG of CERN. And it was DG of CERN. And um, well, I could tell you stories about Carlo, but probably that's not relevant now. But the, the, the SPP bar S, went, once that had finished, and two experiments were done there, and led to Nobel Prizes for several people, including Carlo himself. But instead of throwing it away, it was then used as the next stage in the process to inject protons into the Large Hadron Collider, the new accelerator. So it's a very important lesson in how to reuse and recycle scientific equipment, I think, at a, at, on a very major scale. Anyway, I'm sorry. This, I just this one wasn't recycled. It was used in your time, I think. And I, from the date you gave me, I'm assuming this was a, the, with the PS. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is how detectors worked many years ago. It's a bubble chamber. So it's a chamber with liquid. And stuff comes out of the uh, accelerator and is causing bubbles to occur when particles go through. This was the old technology 40 years ago. Yeah. Now we have the new. Uh, detectors are far more technologically advanced to, to a degree that you can't even imagine. What you see here is you have cameras and they take pictures. They were taking pictures of particles that were going through and making trails of bubbles. That's how you detect a particle. Now the way this is my favorite uh, detector in the world. It's called Gargamel. Uh, it's named after Rabelais, uh, the, the character in Rabelais' um, story. Uh, <laughs> Gargantua yeah. and, and uh, yeah. Pentagram. Uh, and uh, th uh, Steven Weinberg and Abdus Salam and Sheldon Glashow at BU got their Nobel Prizes after a discovery was made here of neutral currents. Um, Steven Weinberg predicted the existence of a boson called the Z boson. The Higgs is not the only boson, even though we hear about it a lot. And that is the action of that Z boson was detected through a neutral current here. But I wanted to go back just to show you an example of the old technology. Uh, the accelerators were basically the same, right, Steve? Yeah. But the, um, but well, the detectors. You can't, you can't use the LHC to do that sort of physics. Or you could, actually, too much if you energy. wanted to. But we, we, you too don't want to do that, because we yeah. want to have as much energy as possible right. now. That's the game. Right. So but, he, but again, in the, in the direction of silly names in particle physics, the second bubble chamber that uh -huh. Amir pointed out the, the, the big fat one in the Right, the big European. That, that was called BEBS, which yeah. stands for Big European Bubble Chamber. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of sad, really. And we, it, it, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a way of sort of poking fun at it, we built a bubble chamber when I was at CERN made out of plastic. And it was much smaller than BEBS. And we called it LEBS. Can you guess what LEBS means? <laughs> Little European Bubble Chamber. <laughs> really sad but true. And that's a very big European uh, detector, Atlas. Yeah. They are their competitors of Steve's group. There's Atlas and CMS. Steve is with CMS. Uh, there are two detectors, and the electronics here is uh, beyond, it's like science fiction, I think, as compared with the Gargamel detector and the big European bubble chamber. Uh, every level here has its own detectors, and every particle is detected in different ways, and there are calorimeters and so on. And you can see some things about it. Uh, that you can see two people there, so it gives you an idea. This is the largest scientific instrument ever built. It's seven stories high. Uh, <laughs> CMS is only five stories high, but this is lighter than CMS. This is only 7,500 uh, 7, tons, which is the uh, weight of the Eiffel Tower, while your detector, CMS, is almost twice as, yeah. as heavy. But what's interesting is the two teams at CERN um, built, the two main teams, CMS and ATLAS, built detectors. They're very different. I'll show you CMS in a minute. And yet their detection power for the Higgs is identical. Mathematically, there is a formula that computes the magnetic field and the distance that a particle travels inside that magnetic field. And when you do that, you use that formula with both designs. Even though they look very different, you get identical power for muons. Um, this yeah. is Atlas again. So uh, you can see again, this is uh, a person standing much higher than ground level. And this is the director, the spokesperson of Atlas standing inside the center 
Oh, this is CMS, so this is the competing design, and uh, you saw the family standing What does CMS there. mean? Uh, you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Compact muon solenoid, yeah. right? It's, it's 50 know. feet high and 100 feet long, and it's referred to as the compact muon spectrometer, compact, because it's a little bit smaller <laughs> than the other one. <laughs> than the other one, yeah. <laughs> So this is uh, CMS being lowered to the ground. It took a whole day, a uh, few feet, an hour, to lower it into its cavity. Imagine holding the Eiffel Tower on these uh, cables. Uh, this is the main part of it, so it's, it probably weighs about yeah. the, size, the weight of the Eiffel Tower. That's the, one, that's the detector I've been working on for the last 20 years, ever mm. since the uh, super collider in Dallas was killed 93. in this country. Then my old research group at Northeastern, we moved over and worked on CMS. But you know, when you get to a certain age, you become less useful. It's really a young person's game is particle physics. And, uh, and, and also, I think, again, I'd like to emphasize that the thing that's impressive when you see these detectors is the engineering feat that has gone into building them. It really is a remarkable feat. I mean, the physicists, they give maybe some of the ideas and, and point at some of the things that we want to have as design characteristics, but it's up to the engineers to realize them. And unbelievable. I was, I was there when that big piece of CMS was lowered. Remember, CMS is 600 feet underground. So it's in a deep cavern. And it was all assembled on the surface and put together on the surface just to make sure that everything fitted together. And then it was dismantled, and every piece was lowered, and then it was put together again 600 right. feet below the surface. And, and when the biggest piece, the, the most dense central piece, was being lowered halfway down, it it's suddenly started showing something that I'd heard about, but I'd never seen it before. It was oscillating in three different modes. It was oscillating up and down, and then slowly those oscillations would die away and they would be transferred into oscillations like that, to and fro, and then slowly those oscillations would die and it would start rotating. Huh. And then it would rotate and then, and it's called damped oscillations, but there's three separate modes of oscillation and they were being converted one to the other and nobody had any idea what to do about it. And the engineers came along and we were talking about uh, getting a PhD <laughs> physics student to, to work on it as a project. So you, you, know, you didn't need to finish it. You have new physics right there. New physics That's right looking there. looking for yeah. new physics. But in the end, the, the, the engineer said, oh, it's, it's trivial. All you've got to do is damp it. And you know, it's, it's damped oscillations. And if you make the damping a bit bigger than it was, then the oscillations die away much quicker. And, and it, it, but it looked really bad at one point because it was oscillating uncontrollably. And that's the sort of engineering problem that has to be solved on a daily basis when you're putting together something like this. Very, very impressive, actually. Good. So we have some more pictures <laughs> of CMS. Um, they let me go into the machine, and so there I got to see where the protons crash. Uh, it was before they closed the tunnel. But I've heard when I visited CMS that there was one of your group who was a, a German physicist who decided they, they were closing the tunnel and raise, uh, starting the uh, magnetic field, which is for Tesla at uh, CMS, right? Yeah. Which is um, 100,000 uh, times Earth's magnetic field, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, this German physicist said, I'm not leaving. And so he remained inside the magnet, and they, tur they turned up the magnetic field. And the way he described it was that when he wasn't moving, it was OK. But the minute he moved, it was very, very painful. So I guess you can survive a magnetic field as well. <laughs> uh, this is just the heart of CMS. Um, this is something else. It's called ALICE. So there's another experiment at CERN to create. Uh, you were talking about neutron stars, and uh, we were talking about quark-gluon plasma, which would be more yeah. fluid and higher energy, right? Then yeah. that would be what they're trying to create here with heavy, uh, with heavy nuclei. This is what it looks like. So there are four experiments in, in CERN, CMS, Atlas, ALICE is this. And this is LHCB, which is looking for the differences that may exist between matter and antimatter. That's a different kind of detector. It's longer because they're looking for things happening along the uh, direction of, of the protons. These are B quarks, and they tend to travel closer to the, to the beam itself, right? Yeah. This is the control Maybe. room. 
of, of the whole operation, uh, full of these screens. And this is the guy. I'm not going to go back to the black hole, but if he's the one to blame, he's the one who controls the power of the LHC. His name is Stefano Redelli, and he's 33 years old. And these are champagne bottles. Europeans love champagne, and they always look for uh, reasons and excuses to drink champagne. So here they are celebrating. Uh, what they are celebrating, I'm not sure, but there's always, certain, there's always a reason to celebrate. One thing or another, even uh, before the crash of the machine in 2008 or, or after, every time a, a new energy level is reached, it's cause for celebration and champagne bottles. And now I want to ask you my next question, and that's um, a question about the people. Um, I came to CERN uh, by chance. Uh, everything that happens to me, I'm, I'm like an electron governed by quantum mechanics. Everything that happens to me is by chance. By chance, I realized that a good friend of mine, who was a uh, mathematician in the UK, had strong connections at CERN. And when I met him, he told me, um, CERN is a place that's magical. I, I really don't know how to describe it. That's one place in the universe, maybe, where people get along. And I don't understand how. They live in harmony. And I thought, I said, Carlo, surely you not tell, you're not exaggerating. And he said, well, Go to CERN, you'll see. And he connected me with a member of the CMS group who invited me and let me go into the machine and tour CERN, and I visited it several times. Uh, and when I interviewed this member of CMS, he said the same words. He said, I came here 12 years ago, and I was in culture shock. I couldn't believe that a place like this exists, and I still don't understand how it functions. That's my question to you. What's the question? I didn't... Ah, <laughs> the question is, how does it function? And why is it harmonious? How and in what, way, in what way is uh, the human element, the, human, uh, the large human collider, as somebody called yeah. it in an article, how does the large human collider called CERN work? How does it work? Yeah. And whether you had the same experience it's or not. Good, oh, yeah, sure. It's, it's often described as the only successful international organization, CERN. And it really does work. It's amazing. I tell you a little story from when I first went to CERN. When I, I, was, um, I finished my PhD in 1969 at Liverpool, and I went to CERN as a CERN fellow, which is like the equivalent of a postdoc these days. And I was working in a group with about 10 or 12 other young physicists, plus an older guy who was only about 10 years older than us anyway. And we all worked together. And after I'd been there about six months, one of the young guys in the group announced he was planning to get married. So uh, there was excitement in the group and, and all the other friends we had in CERN. We said, we must have a stag party. That was the fashion in those days. I don't know. It probably still is. And, and we arranged to go to this famous bar in the old town of Geneva called Clémence. Any of you who have ever been to Geneva will know Clémence. It's a famous... It used to be only beer in those days. I think now they sell wine as well. And, and uh, we all went to Clémence. There were about 40 of us, just a bit less than 40. And we had a wild party, as you can imagine. And after we'd had a couple of beers, somebody said, you know, how many different nationalities are, are represented in this group of people? And we were all friends. You know, we were friends. We were all getting on and enjoying ourselves and drinking beer and telling jokes. There were more than 20 nationalities represented in that group of people. And we were all friends. And, and I realized something very important right there and then. That is the important thing about CERN that it shows a way of people from vastly different cultures. There were Russians, there was a North Korean guy whose family escaped to South Korea. There was Czechoslovak guys, there were Hungarians, there were French, German, Spanish, Italian, English. And the Arab and all, Israeli. All together, all working together, all friends, all enjoying. And I think, I think it's, you remember what Henry Kissinger said once, that in universities the politics is the worst because the stakes are so low. I think the answer to CERN is, is similar to that, that the stake at CERN, the stakes are so big, really. You're trying to understand the most innermost secrets of the structure of our universe. And because of that, it seems to just pull people together who can just ignore all the little stupid problems that you might have as a result of national interest or whatever. Anyway, it works. It really works well, and it still works. It's remarkable. And you know, n not least of the problems is it's, there are three official languages at CERN. There's 
another 97 unofficial languages, but there are three official languages, English, French, and German. And if you're going to work there, you really have to be fluent in one of those, and you have to be able to get by in the other two. And most people do that. So it's just a remarkably successful organization. It's a, a pleasure working there, because you work with people that you would never think you could work with, and, it, and it, it's a pleasure. I, I read somewhere that part of the reason for that is with scientists, everybody, and, and with big science, everybody knows a small piece of the whole story. You can't, you can't centrally run an operation like that because every scientist knows a small piece of the whole thing, and nobody knows everything, and that's why everything works. Is, is that true? Or well, there's certainly just a, a, a lot of truth in that, yeah. But I think that it, it depends. When you're building the detector, that's mm -hmm. certainly truer. Once the detector is built and it's working, then there's usually a team of people who know how to run the detector, keep it operating. And then you collect data, and the data will be in the form of bits, and you write computer programs to analyze the data. And then I think pretty much everybody knows everything at that point. You, you've got the data, and you can look at <coughs> any little detail you want. How does the data processing work? I understand the data processing here offer, uh, sort of presents challenges that have never been faced before. It's very challenging. When, when, uh, when the LHC was first proposed, and by the way, it was proposed by the same guy I mentioned a little bit earlier, Carlo Rubia. He was the guy who proposed the LHC. And when it was proposed, it was pointed out that the uh, computers that were state of the art in, in the, at that time when the LHC was proposed w would not be adequate to analyze all the data that, was being pr that would be produced. And so we, we had this leap of faith that computers were going to keep on advancing at the rate they had been advancing for the previous 20 years. And, and that seems to have worked out, because there now seems to be adequate computer power to analyze the data. Great. So this is uh, one of the big moments that were celebrated with the champagne bottles uh, at the big center, the uh, CERN Control Center, which is the, the center that controls the entire LHC operation. Each of the detectors have their own control room, and they all report to the central, con to the CERN control center. Uh, and this is where the, all the action happens. I think this is uh, um, your friend. Where is that? This is the guy who runs the whole thing, Lynn Evans. I can't see who it is. Right here. They all look the same to me. Oh, OK. <laughs> So uh, when you're at physicists. CERN, this is the cafeteria. So physicists, when they eat, they like tabletops that show them particles colliding. <laughs> and what is that? Do you know? I would what? imagine it's a Higgs candidate. Well, no. No? It no. looks like one. No. no, you need form muons. Or this, the, 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 each table has a different design on it. And I understand that only one person in CERN history could identify all of them as a Japanese physicist. So uh, w w what, what we can tell you, of course, is that these are you know, antiparticles because they uh, go in different directions. And that's the reason why each detector is a huge magnet, because you want to create a magnetic field. So the charged particles are negative. Those that are negatively charged will bend one way, and the ones that are positively charged will bend the other way. So if they have the same mass, the same kind of particles, they're antiparticles. Um, or they could be different things. But you only see electrons and, and, and uh, you know, particles like those. Uh, the muons go outside, and also the, um, uh, the quarks come in jets. So these may be jets. I, I, I don't know. But these, uh, one of the moments that was celebrated was the first high energy collisions. And that's what these are. And you can see two directions. And these are the two main directions. This is sort of sideways. This is the beam. This is how the beam goes. And this is at 90 degrees. These are all the directions at 90 degrees. So uh, the, the, this is from CMS. I think these are the uh, energies, right? This is the calorimeter, and these are the tracks of the particles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, here are some more pictures that are obtained when the uh, collider came to its full half energy. When it built up to half, completed going up to half energy, which is 7 trillion electron volts. And these are some of the collisions. Th these are from the competing group of ATLAS. And these are jets. Jets are quarks, can't be seen alone. And so uh, these are two jets, and jets are important. Uh, this is how you begin to go to 
discover the God particle, the Higgs, which is the particle believed to give everything else its mass. So before you tell us what it means uh, to give mass to everything, I, I want to tell you what, what these two main detectors are looking for when they are looking for the Higgs. The Higgs is the number one purpose of uh, the LHC, right? The second purpose is probably uh, looking for, trying to identify dark matter that uh, permeates galaxies and then looking for hidden dimensions of space-time believed to exist because of string theory. And um, uh, then there are other purposes, such as looking for the differences between matter and antimatter. But the Higgs is a number one. That's the last piece of the, of the standard model. I'll, I'll ask uh, Steve about that. But uh, here's, <laughs> here's, here's a muon. So this is what, when you're looking for the Higgs, the golden channel for the Higgs, this is the one discovery that everybody is looking for, is to find four of these. And that's an atlas. Because only the muons can go through the entire detector. Only they have this ability to go through matter. That's why we're permeate, we, we get bombarded even, you know, though we're inside, we get bombarded by muons all the time, right? And neutrinos as well go through everything. Mm -hmm. But muons will go up to 100 mm -hmm. meters or so underground. Yeah. So um, here are some, here is a muon, I showed you a muon candidate in uh, Atlas, and here's another one at CMS. Basically, this is how you see it. It's a particle that came out of the entire detector. That's a muon. So what you're really looking for is four muons. Here are the purposes of all the experiments uh, at CERN. Here's a Higgs, the God particle, the particle that gives everything mass, decaying into two Zs. The Zs, as I said, were predicted to exist by Steven Weinberg. And the, each one of these decays into two muons right here. So you have four muons. So you're really looking for four muons. Here are the other um, experiments. And this is a Higgs has four muons. Uh, each one of these is a muon. Everything that goes outside completely is a muon. When I talked about this on the radio a few, um, a week or so ago, uh, somebody asked me on a, on a radio program, well, how do you know, how do you discover the, the Higgs? And I said, you see uh, four muons. And I said, how do, what do they look like? I said, they look like a cross. And the interviewer said, a cross, the God particle, appears like a cross. And I said, well, one <laughs> muon goes up, one down, one to the right, and one to the left. So uh, this is what the Higgs would look like in reality. This is a simulation in Atlas. You have these four muons. And then there are other particles there because of conservation of momentum. By the way, so, you should, you should yeah. point out this is not data. Right. This, no, the first one is the, data. This is this simulation is of no, how no, things is, will, might look. Steve, this, this is, is not data, data from, from, uh, from Aleph. That's not from data. Left. Yeah. At CERN, that's what the display says. Oh, that's, that's one alley for yeah, that. Yeah, one. But, but yeah, okay. From Aleph, yeah. yeah. But, this, but I mean, yeah. This is that. real, but there's not enough data. There's only one. But that's a picture of a Higgs. And this is a simulation. So I think I'm done with all the pictures. I'll leave Gargamel, but you can. Uh, so why don't you tell us about the Higgs? You want to talk about the Higgs? Well, I think it's the biggest. Uh, they <laughs> built, didn't they build a $10, million, $10 billion machine to find the Higgs? So yeah. you tell me about the Higgs. I'll tell you about the Higgs. <laughs> You know, the, the, I think the, re the real reason we, build, we built the LHC and the real reason we wanted to build the SSC in, in, in Texas is much more exciting, actually, than looking for the Higgs. We, we have this experience, and it's, I've seen it about five or six times in my career, that every time you build a new particle accelerator with, if possible, 10 times more energy than the previous accelerator, you find something new and always, in my experience, exciting and something that gives you a new insight into the nature of reality. That's the real reason we want to build the LHC. But as I was telling a couple of guys at lunch today, at, it was dinner, wasn't it, this evening, that if you tell a bunch of politicians, you know, please, we'd like $10 billion, and they say, well, what do you want it for? And, and you say, well, we want to build a machine. And, well, what's the machine for? Well, we don't really know. We just think that we might find something <laughs> exciting. They wouldn't give you the money. So <laughs> it's hard to understand why, but they wouldn't give you the money. So what, so what we do is we come up with two or three kind of reasonable extrapolations of current knowledge and, and use those as sort of uh, uh, as something to hang your hat on. And one of those is the existence or not of the Higgs particle. Now, most of you, I'm sure, have heard of 
the standard model, the standard model of particle physics, which is really, it's a model, it's a framework. It's not a theory at all, but it's a framework which kind of every known existing elementary particle can be slotted. It has a, a, a well-defined location in the framework. And it, it does a very good job of classifying, but it doesn't really give too much extra insight, except there's clearly something missing in the standard model. It's clearly, every experiment we've done now indicates there's something missing. And one possibility for that missing ingredient is the so-called Higgs particle. But the Higgs particle may or may not exist, actually. And there may be something else much more exciting. And in fact, I think most physicists now are of the opinion that if we find something else that's not the Higgs at all, but something more different, something different, something that leads us in a new direction, that's probably more exciting for particle physics, actually, and more exciting for our knowledge of the way things are. If we find the Higgs, there's going to be, I think people will sigh a, a, a big sigh of disappointment because we're hoping for something more exciting than the Higgs. Can, uh, let, let me... <laughs> But I, maybe that's my own personal point of view, but I don't think so. I think most physicists maybe, feel that way yeah. now. That maybe we, we should elaborate on why, why the standard model is, is lacking. So there are several reasons for that. One of them is that the forces, we believe now that the universe began with a Big Bang with one force called the super force. And that super force, so, so at, in the beginning, there was only energy, no mass, and there was one force. That's the super force. A fraction of a second, something like a trillionth or less than a trillionth of a second, <laughs> something happened. And that something uh, broke the symmetry of the universe so that mass began to be created. And at the same time, when mass was created, a particular symmetry was broken that uh, separated the electromagnetic force from the weak force that lives inside the nucleus inside the neutron and, and the proton uh, and, and is, is responsible for, for a certain kind of radioactive uh, decay called beta decay. Now what happened then was uh, mass was created and the forces separated. At least two of them separated. The other two separated earlier, gravitation from the electromagnetic fo force. Now what the reason that the standard, the main reason that the standard model is flawed is that it doesn't, the forces don't unite well when you go back to the energy right after the Big Bang. In addition to that, there's a problem of neutrinos, the sterile neutrino, and the, the neutrinos don't, uh, whether they're right-handed or left-handed, there's a problem there when you, when you work with them with the standard model. So there are these hints about the, sta the standard model is like the Bible of particle physicists. You don't believe that. Not quite like the Bible. Oh, <laughs> close. Uh, it's the present version of the Bible. <laughs> Uh, it will be rewritten, maybe, but maybe not. It's a very powerful model. Steve tends to discredit it, but it's a very powerful model. It's been called the greatest th theory in physics. Uh, it rivals probably the, uh, well, general relativity. Do you agree or not? Standard model is, is a human creation of a model and uh, general theory of relativity created by Einstein alone. Which one is, they're about equal? Which, which, to, which standard model and general relativity? Well, there's, I think there's a. Uh, I mean, it's a, a tough lot. question, right? I have my own opinion about this stuff, and it may not fit in with everybody's. But well, that's why I'm asking if, you. If w one of the biggest problems we have in the standard model is we, we don't have any we don't have any way at all of explaining why the particles have the masses they have. Mass is a great mystery, if you like, in particle physics. And I remember when I used to teach my freshman students introduction to science, I'd tell them that one of the greatest mysteries of our understanding of the nature of the universe is we don't know what mass is. And there'd always be some student, some wise guy student, put their hand up and say, surely mass has got something to do with gravity. And, and, and after I'd seen this several times, I realized that you know maybe we're missing something in particle physics because we ignore gravity completely when we're talking about the forces of nature. And you delicately sideswiped gravity when you were talking about the forces. Well, 
c condensing out when, when well, the universe gravity was separated first. We, we just ignore it. And no, yeah. the normal excuse for that is gravity is so weak compared mm. to the nuclear force, the two nuclear forces, and, and, and the electromagnetic yeah. force. But, you know, gravity is like a 1 over R squared. So if you get to very, very small distances, gravity comes but, pretty but strong. But of course there's a... And yet we ignore it because we don't know how to handle it. And there's clearly something wrong with gravity. But the, mass the, the theory. is not... <laughs> hmm? Mass is not gravity because if you're in space and you well, have mass, a massive object... Mass is the... Accelerating it Mass is the you. property of matter that causes objects to interact gravitationally. But it's I mean, Newton invented mass to explain gravitational But Steve, I want to ask you a question. If there's no gravity, you're in the middle of outer space somewhere, and you have, a gra you have an object that's massive, you'll need a lot of energy to accelerate it. It's, it has something in addition to just its gravitational force. Well, I think what you said about general relativity, I mean, it's an incredibly powerful theory. And general relativity, explains what gravity is. Newton didn't do that. Newton just said gravity is a mysterious force that somehow is transmitted at infinite speed across the universe from an object with mass to another object. He didn't explain anything about it, but Einstein came along and said gravity is, is a, a geometrical property of space-time. It's the, the fabric of the universe, and if it's curved, then that is what causes there to be an apparent gravitational interaction. And that is an incredibly successful theory. But it has a problem. If you go down to very, very short distances, at some point we have to use a theory called the quantum theory, which describes what happens inside the atom, really. And the quantum theory is a fundamental theory that we use in particle physics. And the standard model that he mentioned, again, is really a quantum theoretical model. It's based on quantum field theory. And the whole reason that we have things like the Higgs particle is because the fields that are hanging around inside the atom are quantum fields. And if you have a quantum field, if you sh shake it, if you make it change in time, then you get waves. And because of quantum <coughs> wave-particle duality, whenever you've got a wave, you must have a particle, because waves and particles are the same thing. And so if you have a quantum field and you make it change in time, that gives you a wave, and that wave is a particle, and that's the Higgs particle in the case of the field that is supposed to generate matter. But there's something wrong with our picture. We've got general relativity that's a great theory, but it doesn't work inside the atom because it's not a quantum theory. And nobody yet has found a way of mating quantum theory, meaning the standard model, and general relativity. That's the biggest challenge, by the way. If anybody in this audience is thinking of a career in physics, please try and work on that problem. That's the biggest, <laughs> that's the problem we need to solve. And I suspect that if somebody comes along with a theory of gravity that is a full quantum theory, if anybody can do that, but that also includes all of the predictions of general relativity, which are awe-inspiring, to say the least, I bet you the strange properties of galaxies will be explained as well. You know that if you look at galaxies, galaxies are objects made up of hundreds of billions of stars. Everyone we've ever looked at is rotating too fast. They shouldn't be stable objects. And in order to explain that, we've invented this thing called, oh, has my thing come off again? I'm not sure I need this anyway, because I, I, I saw a shout, didn't I? Excuse me. So the, the galaxy, all the galaxies in the universe are rotating too fast. And in order to explain galactic rotation and make it still agree with Newton's laws of motion and Kepler's laws, really, the, the orbital laws, you have to hypothesize that a galaxy contains a lot of matter that you can't see, a lot of mass that you can't see. And that's where the notion of dark matter comes from. It's, and now, of course, there are other things as well that add to the picture. I mean, if you look at two galaxies in orbit around each other, they, they don't obey Kepler's laws unless you assume that there's some mass there that you can't see. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if when somebody comes up with a theory that somehow mates gravity, meaning general relativity, with quantum theory, meaning the standard model, I bet you there'll be some fresh insights. And that's what I'm hoping will come out of the LHC. Some will be pushed in a direction that indicates how to, how to solve that problem. That's a big problem to solve, Good. I think. Well, since we're down to the last few minutes before questions, I want to ask you what you think is I haven't asked you any questions yet, and I, I'd like to ask you some, but go on. Go ahead. 
<laughs> no, please. <laughs> well, you, you, you've mentioned the God particle. Right. And you mentioned this interesting observation that the Higgs in Aleph look like a cross. Uh -huh. is, 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 this, is, this some, is there some connection why you call your book Present at the Creation? Well, I'll tell you a secret. That's not my title. Uh, if you uh, know about That's publishing. what Lederman says about his book, too. Oh, OK. <laughs> he says it's not his title. I guess I have, uh, I have something in common with him. Uh, publishers never rarely let you choose your own title. I had a different title, and the publisher wanted a big title, Present at Creation. At the Creation, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that title. In fact, when I talk about this book, I, I get a lot of people who say, well, at one point, I was in Washington, D.C., uh, giving a talk, and some guy ran to me from the audience and said, present the creation. Creation took six days. He built, made the, the world in six days and then ran out. So <laughs> not my title. It's a double-edged sword, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if it sells books. I don't know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> a different title might do. I, I have no idea. You, you have to be comfortable with your title, I think. So. Uh, I, I'm getting used to this title. Yeah, okay. We're, we're, get, we're, we're surviving. But, but there wasn't some uh, underhanded reason for calling it that? No, no, nothing uh, uh, devious, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but what were you going to ask me? You were going to ask me something. Uh, I was going to ask you for your bet. What, what, if you were to bet on one discovery at CERN that you think will be made, what will it be? If I was to make a bet on bet. what will be discovered yeah. at, yes. at the LHC? Yes. Or at least we'll discover it first. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. But you're we, an insider. We know there's some things that we, we're pretty sure from the two experiments at Fermilab, running at energy about, well, th three times less than the energy. Right. The, energy. The, the LHC is currently running at about three and a half TV. Per beam. Per no, beam. seven TV. Three yeah, and a half so. on three and a half. Yeah. And eventually, but that's going to be a few years yet, it will go up to 14 TeV, mm. which is three times less than the SSC would have been, by the way. The yeah, SSC yeah. would have been 42 TeV. And Fermilab ended up just, I think Under it two. might have just made 2 TeV in the end. Just a bit shy yeah. of 2 TeV. And, and there's a lot of evidence from the two experiments at Fermilab that there's something just over the horizon, something we don't really know what it is. There's something strange about to appear. We don't really have any idea what it is, but there's something. You can pretty much guarantee there's something, because the standard model is clearly incomplete. And if you try and take the standard model and explain all of the existing data that we have using the standard model, all the parameters of the standard model, there's not enough parameters to do it. You need some extra parameters. And normally those parameters are interpreted as the Higgs properties of the Higgs particle. It might be the Higgs, but it might be something else. It might Super be something symmetry. else. Supersymmetry. I'm betting it'll be something else, personally. Supersymmetry. I'm betting it'll be something else, yeah. It won't be the Higgs. And I'm not a betting man. Mm, I can see that. In fact, I wonder what odds you could get on, <laughs> you know, William Hill and the Higgs not being discovered. <laughs> So, do you have any questions? <laughs> okay, are, are there microphones? And okay. Yeah, I have to warn you that both Amir and I, I are going I a little fine. bit no, deaf. I'm fine. He's better than me, but I'm really going deaf. I'm, I'm so fine. please speak up if you want to ask me anything. Um, yes, uh, this is just for the resolution of uh, fact from uh, cinematic fiction. So um, my question to you, Dr. Rucroft, is um, what quantity, if any, of antimatter has been generated by CERN? And what kind of vacuum canister would you uh, have to sort of keep it uh, alive and viable for any period of time? If I understand, how much antimatter has been mm. made at CERN? Yeah. Yes, if any. If any. Well, yeah. we, we've been making antimatter at CERN for as long as I've been working at CERN. It, my PhD thesis was on the annihilation of antiprotons on protons. So we had beams of antiprotons. But a beam of antiprotons in those days was 10 antiprotons every two seconds. 10 antiprotons every two seconds. And that, we may have in, increased that a little bit over the years, but I would say that the total number of antiprotons that have been made at CERN in the entire history of CERN, I don't know, less than 
Certainly less than a microgram, but by far can, less than a microgram. Can I add to that? Um, the the antiprotons are one thing, and then there are positrons, which are the opposites of electrons. But what CERN tried to do is also to create antihydrogen. And the reason is uh, they want to learn about the uh, energy levels of antihydrogen, compare those lines, the spectral lines, with those of hydrogen, which we know a lot about because of you know century of research. Now, um, the anti-hydrogen that was created, I believe, is something like 100 particles that were created. The problem is these don't exist anymore. And the reason for that is when you're creating antiprotons or positrons or any antiparticles that are charged, you can keep them inside a vacuum with a magnetic field. So they stay in the center. They don't move. Because the minute they get out of the vacuum and he hit particles, they disintegrate. They, they annihilate with particles. So the anti-hydrogen that was created is uncharged because the plus and the minus uh, cancel each other. And what happens is when you create them inside, there's a trap that, that holds them. I forget the technical name. It's anti-hydrogen trap, something like that. Uh, they live there for a very short period of time because they're, they're uncharged, and therefore they drift to the edge. The minute they reach the edge, they annihilate with the matter in the edge. So they live for a very short period of time. So these hundred or, or so particles of actual atoms, these are atom, anti-atoms, are gone. Now, uh, if you're wondering about the, 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 the significance of how much antimatter is created at CERN, to make uh, a bomb uh, like in Angels and Demons would take, I forget, I read it somewhere or did the computation, something like a million years of operation at the rate you were talking about. So uh, it's not, not viable. It's funny, I've always had a sneaking suspicion when people used to ask me, why is particle physics supported so well by politicians? And I've always had a sneaking suspicion that CERN was supported for a long time because of the political belief that maybe we would find a way of making better bombs than, than the regular nuclear bombs, nuclear weapons. But I, I, I don't know if your question is related to this at all, but you know this guy, Dan Brown, that wrote those books? Well, he visited CERN a, a few years ago and gave a talk there. And it's, it's a pity we didn't have any photographs of CERN. It's the, the thing that sort of always in a way disappointed me a little bit about CERN, but in a way made me kind of happy. It's, it's a kind of a, it looks very cheap and, and kind of tawdry. All the buildings look very industrial. It's not a fancy place at all. Now, those of you who have been to Fermilab in, just outside Chicago, that's a very fancy laboratory in a park. You know, it's beautiful. It's actually beautifully landscaped. CERN's not like that. CERN looks like some guy who was nuts just threw buildings down at random, you know. <laughs> Looks like, I, I, well, I won't make anything. It's, it's, not a very, it, it's not a very attractive place. And, and the Dan Brown books, they make, he, he writes as though CERN is really attractive with these palatial buildings. And when he was at CERN and he gave a little talk, some people said to him, you know, you've been to CERN, you've seen CERN, you were here before. Why did you write about, why did you make CERN look so attractive when it's not? And he said, look, I have to remind you, my books are fiction. He said, <laughs> I make, it, I make it all up. I made everything up. He said, don't be offended. I just made it up. <laughs> so that's, that's from the horse's mouth. Well, I, I, I don't know if he made it up. When, when I was at CERN, they told me that Dan Brown came for a visit. And in fact, when the movie showed, uh, all the, the license plates outside the theater were CERN people. But uh, my, my friend there told me that when Dan Brown came, there were no eye scanners. And after he left, some time later, there were eye scanners that were put in. But he said, I didn't know whether that was already an idea for CERN security or whether because of Dan Brown's novel, that's why they decided to use these eye scanners. But he said, the, in the book, it's, it's fiction. Uh, you guys need those eye scanners to make sure that if you're down there inside, then the tunnel has They can't to, turn the machine on. Right. Yeah. This has always been a problem with particle accelerators. They're safe unless you're in with the accelerator when it's operating. So we've always had this very sophisticated interlock system at, at CERN. And when I was working there more actively than now, the, 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 every access point had a double key system. And in order to open the door and go in, you had to take the key and put it in your pocket. And the, the, the door could not be locked, and the machine couldn't be turned on, and none of the beams could operate until all the keys were in place. And I've been 
and many incidents at somewhere somebody lost a key. And it's a crisis because the machine can't turn on because somebody's lost a key and they've been struggling with this problem for a long, long time. And now they're doing iris scans as well. Mm. But I was, I, I was telling Amir this the other, uh, a, few, a couple of weeks ago yeah. and he, he almost couldn't believe this story, but it's true. I, I once visited the sort of Soviet equivalent of CERN many years ago, which is a, a laboratory called Serpukov. It's in a town called Serpukov, just south of Moscow. And I went there to give them some lectures on some work we were doing at CERN. And, the, you know, they, I, I don't know if any, ever you, any of you ever went to the Soviet Union, but if you're from the West, they used to treat you like royalty. I mean, it was the most amazing place. And they insisted on giving me this fantastic guided tour of Serpukov. And they introduced me to all of the famous characters, and they introduced me to this one guy. And apparently, in those days, Serpukov didn't have a sophisticated interlock system, so people could open a door and go in and, with the beam on. And this guy was a sweeper, and he was sweeping the floor. And he inadvertently went into the, in front of the beam dump. Now, I should back off a little bit. Whenever anything goes wrong with the accelerator, or they decide they want to stop operating for any reason, the, 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 all the protons are dumped into this big object called the beam dump. And it's just to dump the energy so that they get rid of it, dump the protons. And this guy accidentally walked in front of the beam dump, and the entire beam of the proton synchrotron was dumped in his head. And they introduced me to this guy, and they said, this is a guy who had the entire proton, all the beam, everything, dumped in his head. And this was all through an interpreter, because I don't, don't speak Russian and he didn't speak English. I said, what was it like? And he said, I didn't really notice anything. He said, I just felt that maybe my head felt a little warm. <laughs> and, he, and he was a completely functioning guy, and he'd had all of the, the protons dumped in his head. And, and again, believe it or not, that's a true story too. And, but I don't know, how do we get onto security? Oh, iris scans, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe Sepikov now has much more s stringent safety uh, <laughs> than they used to have. Any other questions? I, yeah. I have a simple one for Amir, if I could. Uh, Amir? Yeah. yeah, from here. Okay. Uh, what was your original title for your book? Collider. <laughs> <laughs> What was the question? What does C mean? What was the original title? You should ask, what does L mean? Oh. Oh, oh okay, yeah, this works. Uh, there's just a quick comment I want to make before I, before I get to my qu uh, question really, really quick. It gets, me a l it gets me a little upset, you know, when, when guys like you guys tell us that nothing can, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light because it... Uh, well, because it happens in Star Wars, so I, I you know, it just gets me mad. <laughs> uh, I'm only teasing you, yeah, but could, um, could you translate for me? Uh, it gets upset because we say, we guys say, that nothing travels faster than light, and he sees it in Star Trek. So you answer that. But I, I know it's, your question right, is I mean, coming, come on. but, but oh. the, the preface to your question can be answered too. <laughs> so. Again, you're in this strange area where you have to be a little careful, theory versus experiment. The theory of special relativity uh, proves mathematically that no object with mass can travel faster than the speed of light, except particles that always travel faster than the speed of light. And, <laughs> and, and the theory of special relativity has solutions for particles that are always less than the speed of light and those that are always more than the speed of light. They're both allowed in the theory of special relativity. Both allowed. Now, experimentally, we've looked for particles. We've measured, I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've made measurements of the speed of particles. And we've looked for particles traveling faster than the speed of light. Many experiments have been done and found nothing, nothing. And we've found many, 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 mil probably millions of, of experimental verifications of the predictions of special relativity. So at the moment, the, the overwhelming evidence is that particles that have mass cannot travel faster than the speed of light. Particles that have no mass always travel exactly at the speed of light. That's according to the theory. And again, we've measured this, and you know the experiments support that. Okay, my question, I uh, really, really quick. 
I don't consider myself a secularist. I do believe in a God. Um, my, my faith sometimes has come into a bit of a crisis, but that's, that's another matter. But um, I, uh, do, do you two guys, do you believe that a belief in God and physics are, uh, are mutually exclusive? I mean, I believe, uh, I really, really, really believe in physics. I think, I think it's absolutely fantastic, and I think it's, uh, it's just uh, very, very fascinating. You know, but I also I, uh, do believe in a God. Uh, I think the question is to do you. Do you think they're mutually exclusive, <laughs> though? Translate for me again. Or, oh, do you believe in God? Is that what you asked? Do you, is, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, no. How would they the question? Is it possible to believe in God yes, and in physics? Yes. I, look, I think the, the, the religions of the world are missing a great opportunity. All of the evidence we have, all of the data indicates that our universe is expanding. And if you extrapolate back, you'll find that 13.7 billion years ago, our universe was a point. Everything in the universe was on top of everything else. Now, we have no idea what happened one microsecond before... Oh. At, at, for some unknown reason, 13.7 billion years ago, that point just spontaneously started expanding. We've no idea how that could happen. No idea. There's absolutely no attempt made by science to explain how that could happen, how, how it could suddenly start expanding. And also, you could say, well, let's go back one microsecond earlier. What was the universe like then? I mean, if I was in the business of forming a religion, and, you know, I wanted to get a tax-free organization, that's where I would put God. I'd say God created the universe 13.7 billion years ago, and it's just evolving ever since. So I think if you wanted to do it, yeah, you could, you could marry science and, and, and religion in some way that suited everybody if you really wanted to do it. But I think the, the, you know, the, the current religious dogma that the earth was created how many years ago? You were telling me the other day, 4,000 years ago? Was it uh, it wasn't six, me. No, no. 6,000 years ago, well, whatever it is. I mean, that's clearly just so contrary to all the evidence that that causes problems, I think. And that's where science and religion go head to head. But I think there are ways of making, it, making them fit if you wanted to do it. My question is a lot less cosmic than, than, than the last question. When I visited CERN, one of the things that impressed me was the computing power. You, you made reference to that before about having to believe that there'd be uh, fast enough computers. Um, but maybe you could comment on the fact that I also noticed when I was there that they had to put those computers right next to the detector. Um, it would have been more convenient if they could have put the computers up on the surface, but they found the need to, to make them all really close. Can you explain why that was? And, and <laughs> so the question was uh, Either you answer the, or about computing. Late. No, you, you're uh, the CERN person here. Uh, why are the... Uh, computing uh, machines that are closest to the detectors, why, why are some of them very close to the detectors rather than a few feet away, right? Or, uh, and then there are other facilities that do processing, but the early processing is done very close to the machine. So the question was why? Yeah. Well, the, when, when the LHC works at the way it's designed to work, they, the protons, the, the, the two beams of protons, they're not a continuous flow of protons. They, they come in about, in each direction, about 3,000 little needles. And each needle contains about a tenth of a trillion protons. And there's 3,000 of these. And what happens when there's a collision is one of these little needles of particles containing 10 to the 11 protons, a tenth of a trillion, collides with this other needle. And when that happens, the two needles pass through each other, and most of the protons just poof, miss each other. But when it's operating as designed, 25 of the protons in this needle will collide with 25 protons in this needle, and you'll get 25 interactions. And the needles are 25 feet apart in the machine as they go around. So if you do all the sums, that tells you that you're going to have events produced on average every nanosecond. A nanosecond is the time it takes for light to travel one foot in air, in vacuum. Now, in wires and things like that, 
light or electromagnetic signals are going to travel a little bit more slowly than that. So because you've got this anomalous, incredible rate at which data is being formed in the LHC environment, you've just got to minimize all of the distances in your computers so that the signals don't get all mixed up with each other. And I guess that's a simple kind of answer to the question, why you want your first computers anyway. The next computers can be further away, but there are some computers that actually decide really quickly which interaction products are worth keeping and which are not worth keeping. I mean, that's the other challenge at the LHC. The, if we tried to record all the data that we're collecting, there, there, there certainly is no way to do that. There's just no way to do it. So what we have to do is select the ones that we think are interesting. And as you can imagine, you've got to be damn careful. Because if you, you know, you, you're familiar with the expression throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, it's ever so easy to do that in this environment. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing again. But the, the simple answer to your question is because things are happening every nanosecond. You've just got to have cables that are nanosecond cables. And a nanosecond is a foot, approximately. Roughly, roughly speaking, that's the answer. So last I was concerned, one of the major intentions of the LHC was to experimentally verify uh, string field theory with the um, perhaps like finding of a super particle or a, something vibrating at a higher frequency. Has there been any progress made in this dominion? So the question is uh, about uh, super string theory, you said, or string theory? I believe there's a, like a, part of, or a string basically oscillating in a higher frequency, and that could be like a super particle. Strings You're oscillating. You're the string theory expert. No, no, you are. <laughs> uh, look, uh, the, the way I understand it, um, the, the, only, the LHC is unable to directly uh, verify string theory because the energy is required. String theory, by the way, as Steve may have alluded to, is the attempt, the modern attempt to put together general relativity with quantum field theory, the standard model. String theory, in the, in theoretically, string theory does it. Uh, and there are lots of results. It's, it's the, the greatest new theory. But in order to, to do that experimentally, you need a huge amount of energy. The only way that the LHC can come close to verifying some of the predictions of string theory is by discovering missing, direction, uh, missing dimensions of space-time. Now, here is, uh, Steve will have something to say about that, I'm sure. There is, uh, uh, w w <laughs> what you have is equations in, in string theory, because string theory is very mathematical. And the equations make a lot of sense in 10 or 11 dimensions. To a mathematician, a dimension is nothing very unusual or interest. Uh, well, it's interesting, but it's not, anything uh, science fiction-y. To a mathematician, a dimension is like an extension of a straight line in this direction. You have three directions here, and imagine a fourth or fifth or sixth and so on. Even some economists can understand higher dimensions than statisticians. But to physicists, that means a real dimension that we can't see. Now, uh, one of the assumptions at CERN, at the LHC, is that there is a way of discovering some of these additional dimensions of space-time that are predicted on purely mathematical reasons, because equations make sense when you assume that the equation exists in a space that has 10 or 11 dimensions. And the way the LHC works is we no longer have the picture, but you have two jets here, a jet, a jet of quarks moving here, a jet of quarks moving here, for example, a two-jet event, and some other particles moving here, such as uh, a Mercedes type of sign. The reason is conservation of momentum. Uh, if that happens and some of the energy is not accounted for, and it's usually in the direction of one of the jets, there's a lot of energy that's missing. The assumption here is that that energy is somehow leaking into another dimension that you can't see. And CERN uh, physicists believe that they're well capable with the, with the LHC to discover such a possibility if it exists within the energy of 14 trillion electron volts. I hope I answered that, your question. You want to say something about that? 
No, I think you're right. I think you're right. Again, I think we're looking for unexpected things, and one would be, but it's very difficult. I assure you, it's a difficult thing to do experimentally. Because, you know, again, these two protons collide, and it's not really two protons colliding at all. It's 10 to the 11 protons colliding with 10 to the 11, or at least some of them. And so it's a big, complicated mess of stuff. And then you, if there's something missing, you've got to be damn sure that you've accounted for everything, and it's very difficult. I, I would be much more comfortable if one of our string theorists would actually make a prediction. Because, you know, we, as I said right at the beginning today, uh, science operates and advances with this delicate balance between theory and experiment. And the theorists are these clever guys. They're, they're kind of like mathematicians, really, but they sit and think, and they come with, uh, develop ideas, theoretically, but they have an obligation, and the obligation is to make predictions that the people like me, experimental scientists, can actually perform experiments to test those predictions. The, the balance has to be maintained. The theorists have to make predictions, and they have to be testable predictions. If they're not, then you know, people like me, we don't take the theories very seriously. We say, well, you haven't done your job yet. Do your job, and then we will do our job, and we'll, we'll collect data to test whether your predictions are true or not. And I'd like to see the string theorists make some predictions that are really testable, realistically testable. And I think looking for missing energy is very difficult. Some people think it can be done, but it's but very difficult. You said something interesting, that they're like mathematicians. In fact, I, I find it fascinating that <laughs> Ed Witten... I said that a, deliberately to see if you'd pick up on it. <laughs> one, of the, <laughs> one of the main uh, uh, researchers on string theory got the highest prize in mathematics. Yeah. He got the Fields Medal, not yeah. the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Uh, so the, the interface between math, he claims he's a physicist, yeah. but what he does is pure mathematics, and he got the biggest prize in mathematics. So math, physics at that level are very yeah. interrelated. Yeah, I know. In fact, that leads me to just say something else, too. I, I, I keep mentioning this delicate balance between theory and experiment. And I think, really, for the last 10 years, that balance has been a bit lost. That is, we've been a bit dominated by theory in particle physics. And I think the great thing about the LHC is that balance is going to come back now. And uh, I predict there will be some major advances in our understanding uh, of the nature of the universe at this fundamental level. There'll be some major advances coming from LHC data. So I, I think it's very exciting. And, you know, keep your eyes on, on, the, on the Boston Globe. I guess even the Boston Globe will talk about discoveries at the LHC. There, there will be some, and they'll be interesting. Hi, so I understand I have the last question, so I was to tell everyone that. It's a fairly simple one, but it's been a matter of a lot of discussion here at the museum. I work here, and uh, it's what exactly, and you kind of alluded to this, I don't know, it was because of this question, though, of what the large is actually referring to. Is it talking about the fact that the collider itself is extremely large, or that it has the ability to collide large hadrons like lead nuclei in it? So curious, what's the large refer to? I think it's because it's large. Um, hadrons <laughs> are... For, is it the collider are, or is it the hadrons that are large? No, it's a lar large, large, uh, large modifies collider, I think. Am I right? What was that about? Lar does large modify collider or hadron? Oh. Yeah, I think it refers to the collider. But a lot of people have suggested that L should mean last. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, that I note. think we will <laughs> close our conversation, which has been delightful and really intriguing. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, Amir will be signing books backstage. I'm sure Stephen would be happy to sign those books, too. <laughs> and and books will be available for purchase also backstage. Um, we are very happy that you all came out tonight. Um, this was really fun. And we hope you'll come back, because we're going to do um, more physics, um, as it says on the back of your program notes. Um, in um, March, we are having Brian Green and Michio Kaku both come. So it should be a um, continuation of these wonderful ideas and mysteries. Um, again, thank you for coming, and um, we hope to see you again in future programs. <laughs>